Welcome back to 1968. Our story takes place between the end of January and the end of March. It's about war and television. The Vietnam War is being fought on television, also the war to end the war, several political wars, and one ski slope war. No wonder a kind of performance reality has evolved, one where image counts at least as much as truth. Of course, a notion like that can get you in trouble because, as Lyndon Johnson once pointed out, while you're saving your face, you're losing your ass. He did not speak from ignorance. One place where performance reality evolved and where image counted more than truth was the psychedelic saloon, for want of a better phrase. Places like Fillmore East, which opened that winter in New York City, were concert stages where kids could come and drink a 7-Up, maybe sneak a joint or a tab of LSD, and watch The Doors or The Grateful Dead or an artist like Janis Joplin singing as if her heart would break or her larynx. It was a distortion of sound, of mind, and many of our kids embraced it because they had looked at the real world and didn't like what they saw. And some very straight establishment adults looked at the war in Vietnam that winter when the winds of change were blowing and changed their minds. One was the brand new Secretary of Defense. I, Clark M. Clifford, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear. Clark Clifford has been a trusted advisor to presidents, Democratic presidents, for 20 years, and he's known to be a strong supporter of Johnson's Vietnam policy. I reflected what the public reflected, and that was that we were prevailing and that almost any time the war would be over. But in his first few weeks in office, Clifford's view of the war and Johnson's policies takes a dramatic turn. I spent, I can't tell you how many hours in what is known as the tank with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I couldn't find out what our plan was for victory in Vietnam. The reason I couldn't find out was we didn't have any. And it was at that time that I changed my entire opinion of the war in Vietnam. What a field day for the heat. A thousand people in the street. Singing these songs and the carry inside. Then there are those who don't think we ought to be fighting this war in the first place, and have been saying so for some time now. Not all of them are males of an age to be drafted, not all of them are young. In 68, the young are divided too, and not just by the war. Here is one side. Here's the other side, psychedelic, and even if you didn't drop acid, LSD, the music could often make you feel as if you did. Jimi Hendrix. Janis Joplin. Jim Morrison and the Doors. Jefferson Airplane. Paul Kantner played guitar for the airplane. I don't want to glorify drugs, but in 68, early 68 anyway, drugs were still relatively cool in the society. In those days, people were, drugs were almost super, not, not the main thing. They were just a, an attendant sacrament almost to the wonder that you were experiencing. But by March, the counterculture is a consumer item, and its chief capitalist is poster artist Peter Max. His work shows up on posters, but also on motor scooters, even a line of clocks by General Electric. But this way I'm able to uh, give art to the people, to my friends on this planet. There was no strategy on my end to capitalize, and so maybe I was the most withered person at the time, visually. And so all the corporations wanted to take my works and apply them on their stuff. We'll ride on the rain, we'll sail on your touch, I'll talk to your eyes that I love so much. 
Rod McEwen. Call him the capitalist of romance. This gravelly-voiced singer and poet releases an incredible four albums between February and March. Good vibes are big business. Well, it's odd because all of a sudden your name's in public domain. I mean, on the one hand, it's a, it's a big treat to, to wake up in the morning without knowing anything about it in advance and find, find yourself in Peanuts or Pogo. And his book, Listen to the Warm, is a bestseller. How does it sound today? His love collective, not anymore it's not. We're lucky if it lives above the jukebox bleat. And so when I think of love and loving, I think of people dying alone for lack of love. These are the days of the dancing, six feet apart. Discotheque has tapped that time of loving into time. Mr. Roebuck still likes Mr. Sears. Abercrombie's stuck with Fitch all these years. There must be others out there somewhere. But where? Certainly not at Quezon. Since the Tet Offensive began in January, some 6,000 Marines have been pinned down at this outpost. They are steadily bombarded by rockets and mortar fire. They are surrounded by 20,000 North Vietnamese regular troops under siege and waiting. Jeff Gralnick is covering Quezon for CBS News. Once siege mentality had settled in, the Marines there were in effect live bait. What the military wanted, what the military felt it needed, was a set peace battle. In Washington, Lyndon Johnson is obsessed with holding Quezon. He has a scale model of the base in the White House, and he has pledged that Quezon will never be another Dien Bien Phu. The decisive defeat that drove the French out of Vietnam in 1954 and whose anniversary is approaching. Meanwhile, the Marines at Quezon wait. You couldn't approach Quezon except by air. C-123s were being shot down, C-130s were being blown up on the runway, helicopters were being shot down, C-130s had come in at uh, 500 feet, drop stuff all over what was left of the runway, and then hightail it up uh, and out of the way. When the weather is clear, the fury of American air power is called to the hills surrounding the base. Newsweek says it best, the agony of Quezon. It was like living in a latrine. There, there's an inescapable aroma at Quezon that nobody could put their finger on. It just smelled like Quezon. It was awful duty. On March 10th, the New York Times publishes a leaked report that General Westmoreland has asked for 206,000 more troops, a 40% increase in our commitment. And for a war, we've been told we're winning. Two days later, in the icy waters of the New Hampshire primary, the president's political strength will be tested for the first time since the Tet Offensive. The inquisitor, Senator Eugene McCarthy, has been campaigning vigorously all over the state against the war. Senator Eugene McCarthy in New Hampshire. Our country, right or wrong. When right, to be kept right. When wrong, to be put right. Vote McCarthy, March 12th. I think almost anybody running against Johnson on, on any platform, uh, in a one-on-one -on -one in the Democratic Party, could, could have gotten more than 12%, maybe 20%. And with the addition of the war issue, why, uh, you, you could figure maybe 10% more the president's name is not on the ballot. But his campaign machine is urging a write-in vote. McCarthy's campaign has caught the hearts and minds and energy of the young. College students invade New Hampshire by the busload, even getting a shave and a haircut to be clean for Gene. McCarthy does better than even he expected, 42% of the vote to Johnson's 49%. We were able to claim an absolute victory in terms of delegates and a relative victory in terms of what it had been said we'd get in the way of a popular vote. This may have been almost as big a shock to Johnson as the Tet Offensive, because this was his world. This is the supreme politician. This is the man who has risen from the, from the hill country of Texas from nothing on his savvy about votes, elections, and people. 
Robert Kennedy is still not a candidate, and he will not become a candidate if President Johnson will accept a deal. Kennedy's press secretary was Frank Mankiewicz. He had uh, made a proposal. He had used Ted Sorensen to go to Clark Clifford, who was then the uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, and in a sense put that proposition forward, that a commission of wise men might perhaps study the situation, would come up with recommendations, the president would abide by them, and if uh, the president would agree to do that, then uh, Senator Kennedy would, uh, would not run. So I went immediately to President Johnson, repeated in detail what Ted Sorensen had said to me, and President Johnson summarily said, not acceptable. Just go Ted, tell Sorensen right away, I want no part of it. Let him do anything he chooses to do. I am announcing today my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. I do not run for the presidency merely to oppose any man, but to propose new policies. President Johnson does decide to consult with wise men about the war, wise men of his own choosing. President Johnson uh, had a number of outside advisors, uh, people who had served in previous administrations, who had been troubleshooters, who had been military people. People like former Secretary of State Dean Acheson, former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Maxwell Taylor. Nearly five months earlier at the White House, the wise men, nearly all hawks, had supported the president's Vietnam policy. Now, the birds were not all of a feather. And I briefed on the political diplomatic situation. I remember a few things about the briefing. For example, I remember at one stage very clearly Clark Clifford uh, saying to me that I think that, uh, that a military solution was, uh, was feasible. And uh, my answer was that in the circumstances and under the restrictions that were, that were imposed, that I didn't think that that was foreseeable in a in a short, in any foreseeable period of time, and I recommended very flatly and directly that we go for a bombing hall and a negotiation. He invited them back, spent afternoon and part of a morning with them, and was shocked to find out that almost everyone had changed his mind. Come back to the last weekend in March of 1968, when Lyndon Johnson takes a good look at his cards and folds his hand. Our world continues, winds of change in the winter of 68. Headache, pressure, and congestion all together. Major symptoms of sinus complex. You need to feel better, but not drowsy. You need Sinutab 2, no drowsiness formula, so you feel altogether better. You've just had your dentures professionally cleaned. How can I keep them looking this way? With professional strength Effordent. Effordent removes stains, kills germs, cleans away plaque, even in between. For a professional looking clean, get Effordent. This is the beginning. The all new Chrysler LeBaron. Beauty with a passion for driving. Advanced front wheel drive traction. Positive response suspension. Fuel injected high torque power. Choose precision five speed. Heart pounding turbo. All with the Chrysler protection plan. The new LeBaron from Chrysler. Driving to be the best. <laughs> Annoyed hates hot quality pizza. He loves to make your hot pizza ice cold. Call Domino's Pizza and avoid the noise. <laughs> we keep the cold out and all this quality in. So when you want quality pizza hot and delicious, Domino's Pizza delivers. One call does it all. Sunday, Kathleen Turner, Michael Douglas, and Danny DeVito romancing the stone. Welcome back to March 1968. A presidency shaped by and haunted by television is about to reach a fitting climax. Fitting because it will take place on television. It is the last weekend in March. President Lyndon Johnson has said he will speak to the nation on Sunday night. He plans to announce he is willing, once again, to stop bombing North Vietnam as an incentive to peace. It is not all he will announce. Later, Johnson would say that doing what's right isn't the problem. It's knowing what's right. Sitting here resting my bones 
and this loneliness won't leave me alone. In late March of 68, Lyndon Johnson was looking for assurance and finding doubt. His approval rating in the Gallup poll had fallen to its lowest ebb. The war had put many of his plans for the great society on hold. And trusted old allies like Martin Luther King told him he was wrong. I have become deeply disenchanted uh, with President Johnson. I feel that he is so emotionally involved in the war in Vietnam and uh, so concerned about saving face more than achieving peace. With Bobby Kennedy now in the presidential race, Johnson knew he was up against not just a candidate, but Camelot. What he was looking at, of course, was that Senator Kennedy was going to beat him for the nomination, and that he would wind up then in history as a sort of a between two bookends, each one of which a Kennedy. Lyndon Johnson was exhausted. Secretary of State Dean Rusk. Except for the men and women who carried the battle out there and their families, no one in this country agonized over Vietnam more than did Lyndon Johnson. We could never uh, stop him from getting up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning to go down to the operations room to check on the casualties from Vietnam. Every one of those took a little piece out of him. On the day before his Vietnam speech, Johnson worked with the man who wrote it, Harry McPherson. He said, oh, you can, it's all right. You don't have to worry about the length. I think I want to have an ending of my own. And he walked on out of the room, and I turned around to Clifford and said, is he going to say sayonara, a goodbye? Clifford looked at me as if I were an idiot. On television's Hollywood Palace, the night before the president made his speech, Jimmy Durante sang prophetically about old man time. Old man time, he's so mean, meanest man you ever see. He gives you youth and he steals it away. Sunday, March 31st, Washington, D.C. And they took very heavy to keep up, make it be a day there. They took With a crude videotape recorder, Lyndon Johnson rehearses what will be his most famous speech. His secretary and I sat there with him and, and made little changes in what he was doing. I don't know any other speech that he ever rehearsed uh, to this extent. Sometimes he went over them, but this one had to be perfect. Johnson called me and said, uh, what do you think about the speech? A peculiar question since I'd been doing nothing else for two months. So I think it's okay. I'm glad it's coming out the way it did. And he said, I've got my own ending I'm putting on. I said, so I've heard. He said, do you know what's in it? I said, I'm afraid I do. And I'm really sorry. And he said, well, OK, thanks, partner. And I can remember that Sunday evening sitting down from the television set and uh, cross-legged on my rug. And I watched, and the speech went on just as I expected it. Now the President of the United States. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight I want to speak to you of peace in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Tonight, I renew the offer I made last August to stop the bombardment of North Vietnam. When the speech ended, or should have ended, he said, and then I have something else to add, and instantly, Without any other word, I knew precisely what was coming, that he was going to do it. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. The Johnson presidency. In a way, it has become another casualty of Vietnam. Later, in his memoirs, Johnson writes about that night. And tonight, actor Dennis Weaver reads some of what Johnson had to say. In 45 minutes, I had finished. It was all over, and I felt better. The weight of the day and the weeks and the months had lifted. I had done what I knew ought to be done. Now it was history, and I could do no more. Just before I drifted off to sleep that night, I prayed that Hanoi had listened and would respond. The chance for peace, the opportunity to stop death and destruction, 
the opening toward a new decade of hope. All these were enfolded in the words I had spoken. There was nothing more I could do that day. All that I could do, I had done. Come back to our world after the winter of 1968, to some things we saw on television and some things we did not. Our world continues in a moment. Stop squirming. Sucret Spray will take care of your sore throat. Trust me. For relief of sore throat pain, Sucrets last twice as long as the other leading brand. Maximum strength Sucret Spray lasts twice as long. Calgon, take me away. Indulge yourself in Calgon luxury. Let Calgon soften and pamper you. It's like no other bath experience. It's paradise. Calgon, lose yourself in luxury. Sibling rivalry. If you worry about your kids fighting, John Stossel shows why it actually could be good for them. Watch 2020. Tonight. Welcome back to the legacy of the television battles of those few weeks in 1968. On the last day of March, the television battles of Lyndon Johnson ended. But when Johnson stepped out of the picture, the picture tube remained filled with images of war and violence at home. Which is to say, the mirror remained accurate and the winds continued to blow. This is the end, my only friend, the end. On April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot to death outside a motel in Memphis, Tennessee. He was 39. So, uh, my thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Moments after Robert Kennedy claimed victory in the California primary, he was shot to death in the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. The convention he never got to in Chicago was the most outrageous in American history. For five days, police and National Guardsmen clubbed, gassed, and arrested anti-war demonstrators and bystanders as well. Three superstars of the counterculture became victims of their own excesses. Jim Morrison of The Doors died of a heart attack at 27. Jimi Hendrix died from an overdose of barbiturates in 1970. 16 days later, Janis Joplin died from booze, drugs, and perhaps her own rage. The war in Vietnam continued until 1975, seven years and one month from President Johnson's speech, Saigon fell to the communists. We watched it on TV. Governments also learned from the television war. They learned they didn't want to fight their wars on television unless they controlled the television. And that is why these pictures of the American invasion of Grenada in 1983 were taken by the United States government. Neither journalists nor their cameras were allowed to come along for the ride. The politicians explained we might get hurt. Also, we might blow the surprise. And in 1982, when Great Britain went to war over the Falkland Islands, it controlled TV coverage. This is Calgary. At the Winter Olympics of 1988, it will be a busier place than it is now. And instead of 36 cameras, there will be close to 100 cameras. Well, there it is the way it was in February and March of 1968. It was not just the reality of the Vietnam War that soured Lyndon Johnson's presidency, Americans had been dying in Vietnam when Eisenhower was president and would still be dying there under Gerald Ford. What changed that winter was our perception of the war. There was a new awareness that we would have to give more to the war to win it or settle for less than victory. And television did that. Never mind that the Tet Offensive failed. Television showed us the enemy at the gates of Saigon. It showed us a president 
crumbling a little more every day, right there in our living room. Television did not tell us whether to stay in the game or get out. It did show us what the stakes were. And on the subject of the power of television, let's get one thing straight. The power of television is roughly that of a hula hoop. The power is in the pictures. And the most powerful pictures aren't always on television. For example, remember the day General Loan shot the prisoner in broad daylight and in front of cameras? Television showed us the moving pictures of what happened. We saw the general shoot, we saw the man fall. But the really moving picture was the one where nothing moved. This one. In Eddie Adams' picture, as in the life of the man who was shot, time is stopped. Nothing happens next. Forever. Except in your own mind. And that, too, is the power of a picture. And so it goes. These things also happened in the winter of 1968. For heroism at Da Nang, Lieutenant Jane Lombardi, an Air Force nurse, became the first woman to receive combat decorations in Vietnam. Cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, was killed while testing a new plane. At the ordination of an Episcopal priest in Berkeley, California, the hymns were played by a rock group, Mother's Laundry. The sermon was titled, God is Doing His Thing. A new movie by Mel Brooks, the producers, featured a song and dance number called Springtime for Hitler. In the first heavyweight title fight, in the new Madison Square Garden, Joe Frazier knocked out Buster Mathis in the 11th round. In Memphis, Lisa Marie Presley, daughter of Elvis and Priscilla, was born. In India, the Beatles were meditating with the Maharishi. For the Our World Viewer Guide, write to Community Relations, ABC, 1330 Avenue of the Americas, New York, New York, 10019. For a transcript of this broadcast, send $3 to Our World Transcripts, 2 John Street, New York, New York, 10038.